V, and I, or maybe some people would say the new Italian version. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, from Luke 15, uh, verses 1 through 7, and it's the parable of the law. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents over nine, than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Good morning. Pretty good, but could be better. Let's try that again. Good morning. good morning. And it's a good morning. As Sean described it, it's a great morning. The sun is shining. God's glory is all around us. Best of all, we've got air conditioning in God's house this morning as well. It's a good morning because we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ. And definitely the power of prayer that Sean has shared with us, I think we need to reciprocate Sean told us this morning he's a little bit overwhelmed, and when we're overwhelmed, prayer is the best medicine. So I want you to say with me these words, uh, bless you, Pastor Sean. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for your friendship. May your light continue to guide us to God's ways, and that in fact all of us will be an answered prayer. Amen. By the way, we are an answer prayer. Uh, Curtis Belcher, who's likely back at the station switching the buttons, he and I talked uh, on Friday. And in fact, uh, Curtis and I went to Haiti in 2010 at the first earthquake, and we rebuilt a school and an orphanage. And I said on Friday, Curtis, do you think we should be doing something now? And he said, I'll talk to the folks in Haiti. So perhaps the next time on this platform, Sean, this church and church family will become an answered prayer to help those folks in Haiti. So God bless you this morning. So what are we talking about? Oh, come on, you read it. What are we talking about? Shepherds, shepherds exactly. And last week we talked about that shepherd talking to a sheepdog. Remember that? He said to the sheepdog, did you round up all the sheep? And what did the sheepdog say? All 30 of them. And the shepherd said, we only have 28. And what did the sheepdog say? Rounded them up, exactly. And by the way, Fred Slade did like that pun. There's no doubt about that, all right? He is our chair of finance, in case you want to know his role in our church family. Well, today, the mother sheep says to the little lamb, it's pasture bedtime. Oh, come on. <laughs> so we're going to talk about shepherding again today and the need that we, in fact, follow the shepherd that, in fact, finds the lost sheep. So let's pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the teacher came in front of her class and announced to her class that she was, in fact, an atheist. And she said to her little class, how many of you are atheists? And the little kids really didn't know what an atheist was, but they wanted to be like their teacher, so their hands exploded in the air that they were all atheists. Except one little girl. She's sitting with her hands in her pockets. And the teacher went over to her and said uh, to this friend that's a little bit different, uh, why, why didn't you put your hand up? <laughs> the little girl said, because I'm not an atheist. And she said, the teacher said to the little kid, well, wh what are you? And the little kid said, I'm a Christian. 
And so the little teacher looked back at the little girl and said, why are you a Christian? She said, because I know my God is loving and all-powerful, and my mom is a Christian, and my dad is a Christian, so I'm a Christian. This really perturbed that atheist teacher. And she looked back at this little kid and said, well, excuse me. What if your mom was a moron and your father was a moron? What would that make you? And the kid said with a smile, an atheist. <laughs> so the Pharisees say to the crowd... Does everyone here follow the laws of Moses as we command? Not wanting to be thrown out of the temple, everybody in the crowd said, Oh yeah, Pharisees, we follow all the laws of Moses, except one man, one man who was born blind and now could see. And the Pharisees ask, Well, who do you follow? And he says, I follow Jesus, the Son of God. And the Pharisees get kind of angry and say, well, why? And the man says, hey, I was blind, and now I see. Jesus is the Messiah. Even more angry, the Pharisees say, well, excuse me. What if we said people like you, we throw out of the temple? What if we say people like you, we don't eat with? What if we say people like you, we don't care or even like? What would that make you? And he said with a smile, a Pharisee. So that joke wasn't so silly after all, was it? No, all right? We're talking about people that in fact don't understand the personal knowledge of Jesus and the fact that you and I need to identify as Christians because we do know the love and the power of of God. Our scripture this morning that Garth shared with us is explaining how God cares about all his sheep. He clearly talks about the ability of God to find and forgive. God, in fact, rejoices in finding the sheep. The imagery, by the way, of the shepherd would not have been acceptable to those Pharisees. In last week's sermon, we heard how the Pharisees were the thieves and the robbers and the wolves to the sheep. Jesus is the true shepherd we heard last week, who in fact the sheep know his voice and in fact they follow him. The good shepherd is prepared to die for us, his sheep. Shepherds were working men who protected the flock. They were not well regarded by the Pharisees. In fact, they were considered kind of shady characters. The biblical scholar Michael Willett writes that the shepherds had an unfortunate habit of confusing thine with mine. In fact, when the shepherds hit town, the stuff started to get missing. Furthermore, the shepherds did not acknowledge or honor the ceremonial laws that were so sacred to those hierarchy Jewish Pharisees. Jesus tells the parable then in context to what Garth just read us, that in fact God is a shepherd. So if you are a Pharisee today, and all of a sudden this preacher, this Nazarene, gets up and says, oh, by the way, I've got a story, i got a parable, and in that parable, God is a shepherd. They would have just rolled their eyes and said, yeah, right, our God's a shepherd. Absolutely, because what was Jesus doing? He was opening the eyes of his listeners. The parable is a lesson about being lost and being found. A lesson that reinforces the theme that Jesus knows his sheep and does not give up on any of them. What's the deliverable in this morning's sermon? That Jesus does not give up on you or me or anybody you know or love or any of those prayers that Sean shared with us. That Jesus is part of our relationships, our partnership, most importantly, our life. A lesson that the joy of rejoicing is being taught through the flock. This morning, I want to talk about three things. I want you to consider the sheep. I want you to consider the shepherd. And I want you to consider that this search and rescue mission was in fact a search and rejoicing mission. So those are the three areas that you and I are going to talk about in the next few minutes. The sheep. The sheep. Jesus <laughs> compares us to sheep. Not likely the most flattering comparison, if you think about it. Sheep have not enjoyed the good PR that other animals have, have they? 
Nobody ever says, strong as a sheep, brave as a sheep, faithful as a sheep, smart as a sheep. Even those with big appetites have never said, I sheeped out on pizza. All right? that, that just doesn't happen, all right? In fact, if I asked you, what your reference is, Jerry, to sheep, you're likely to tell me, well, foolish as a sheep or silly as a sheep. But in fact, aren't sheep very valuable to humans, right? Doesn't their wool make clothes for us? Doesn't their milk make cheese for us? And for us carnivores, doesn't their meat taste wonderful with mint jelly? Sheep can survive on sparser pastures than cattle, and in fact, are very able to cope with rougher terrain better than cattle. In fact, according to sheep, researchers. <laughs> and friends, there are such people in the world, all right? These people are dedicating their life to sheep worship and sheep research. And they, in fact, have documented that sheep are a very social animal, that sheep can recognize other sheep. And in fact, sheep can recognize humans, back to the voice of the shepherd. That sheep, in fact, are emotionally complex. They're not only sheepish, but in fact, they have fear Anger, boredom, sadness, and happiness. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Oh yeah, that's us, isn't it? Uh, in fact, Jesus calling us sheep is kind of a good fit if you think about it because we have those wonderful qualities in our personalities. Unfortunately, sheep are stupid when they stray away. And that's a tough word and I very seldom say it, but they are a stupid sheep when they stray away. It goes wandering without any inclination or instinct of how to return back to the flock. And furthermore, sheep cannot defend themselves. They depend on the shepherd to protect them from predators and to, in fact, bring them to fresh pastures and water. Sheep wander away because they fail to realize the benefits of being with the shepherd. Truly, the sheep think that the grass is greener on the other side. We are that sheep. Jesus is telling the crowd, look at yourself. Look at one another. Look at us today. God has blessed you and I with life. <laughs> That's the life we have inside us. God has told us in the book of Genesis that you and I have dominion over his creation. And God let his son die on a cross for our sins and conquered sin and death for us. Yet, we still wander away. We stray not to necessarily greener pastures. We stray like the sheep. We get lost. We're, we're stupid. Uh, the wildernesses of philandering. When you, you've got a great, wonderful relationship as a husband and wife, and yet you let that philandering darkness enter that relationship to, to ruin it? You don't think you're a stupid sheep there? <laughs> I think you are. How about that social drink that becomes an alcoholic addiction? Is that lost in the wilderness? Is that being stupid in terms of your body and your relationships? What about money making? That some people are just obsessed with having to make money, all right? And I've often said, You've never seen a Brinks truck following one of my hearses to the cemetery, all right? So that money stuff, trust me, it doesn't go very far in that place that is called heaven. So I suggest to you that money-making can be very evil if it becomes obsessive. How much is enough? And I've got friends in my life that can't answer that question, all right? They, they always have to have more. What about meanness? <laughs> is there a lostness to meanness? That when you could say something good or something bad, you chose bad. And you were mean just because you were having a bad day. Right? You, you were being mean because you had your grumpy pants on and you took it out on everybody around you. Amen, brother. All right? I can recognize that one. I wandered around all of North America giving speeches. All right? I was a great motivational speaker. Gave all my money to Easter Seals and Cancer Research. And the fact is, I would fly all over the place, and they treated me well, trust me, when you're the keynote speaker. But for the two or three days before the speech, I would be so uptight. Sean, you think you're a bit overwhelmed? I was totally overwhelmed. And my father used to say, when I got back from the speaking engagement, you know, Jerry Jr., quit taking out on us. 
all that stress about giving that talk down in Toronto, and you beat us up for three days. I'm really glad that speech is over, but trust me, none of us like to be around you when you're getting ready for the speech, all right? Now, I do like preaching here, and I'm not mean here, by the way. I want to tell you that all right, all right? I love coming here. You guys make me feel so, so good. You have no idea. Sean, you can identify with this. When you're at that door, and people say, hey, Wayne, that was, that was a pretty good comment there. You know, you made me think, kind of deal. Or some of you text. That breaks down meanness, all right? And, and I suggest to you that it's so very important that we cannot be mean. And what about hurtfulness to ourselves and to others? And especially others that we love. I was involved with a family a couple weeks ago. And I knew the guy that had died. And he was a great guy. And I really enjoyed his friendship. And he had done stuff in the community together. And his wife said to me, well, Jerry, I know you really liked him. But he was a totally different guy at home. <laughs> Isn't that a horrible comment? That, that you're great outside. But boy, get inside that house and you're not so great. That's the getting lost in the wilderness. That's the sheep that we have gone astray. More specifically, I might suggest to you we become black sheep uh, with regard to family and friends. The term black sheep originates from the fact that every now and again, a black sheep was born. And it was considered undesirable because its wool could not be dyed. So all the white sheep, they can make it any color, sweaters, or whatever you want. But that black sheep's wool, sorry, can't do that. So in the 18th and 19th century in England, they decided that a black sheep would be a disgraceful term for family members or friends. And I might suggest to you this morning what was written by Garth tells us that God seeks the lost sheep and can find its way back to the flock. People whose lostness has made their wool worthless. Today's sermon tells you you are worth. You have worthiness in you. And that worthiness will bring you back to the flock. There was a man who worked for my father. His name was Bert. He was a really good funeral professional, an excellent ambulance attendant, he had a magnificent voice. He sang in his choir. Everybody loved his solos. He had a great sense of humor, always had a joke for you. Everybody loved Bert. Bert was an alcoholic, and he was a bad alcoholic. He used to go out on benders and just totally get lost. Nobody knew where Bert was. In fact, when his eldest son, Jerry, which interestingly was named after my father because those of you that complain about oh hip and Eileen, you'll understand where this comment's coming from. Back in the day, you used to have to pay the hospital to let the mother out of the hospital with the baby. So at St. Joe's Hospital downtown, the old St. Joe's, it was 25 bucks to get out of the hospital with your baby. Well, I just told you, Bert was on a drunk. He was on a bender. There was no Bert. So my dad felt badly for his wife, Terry, and so he went over and gave the people at the hospital $25 and was able to get the mother and baby out of the hospital. Bert, when he was sobered up, was so pleased with my father, he named the kid after my dad. <laughs> so we had another Jerry in the world, all right? I guess he was Jerry the third. But, but having said that, uh, Bert was on benders, all right? Bert would, in fact, borrow money from anybody here and never pay you back. Bert was asked to leave his church because of drunkenness. Bert was very much lost. So one day I am working with Bert and I go into the garage and Bert is laying on the floor. He had vomited all over his clothes. He was clutching a picture of his wife and then kids. And in fact, he had been drinking embalming fluid. Now, I got to tell you, the chemistry in embalming fluid is, it's going to kill you. There's no doubt about it. In fact, you should never be able to live when you've drank a half a bottle of embalming fluid. But you know what? God had not given up on Bert. <laughs> Absolutely not. And on that day, Bert confronted his demon of alcoholism as he laid on that floor covered in vomit and he looked up at me and he said, Jerry Jr., I would not wish this on my worst enemy. And on that day, Bert realized that he had to change. God bless my father. Dad got him into the AA. Bert was a World War II veteran, and, and Dad got him a pension. And Bert quit drinking. <laughs> and Bert uh, fell in love with his family again. And Bert never missed a birth of any of his grandchildren. 
And when Bert died at his funeral, the pastor reminded everybody that God had never given up on Bert. Which brings me to the shepherd. <laughs> Jesus clearly di differentiates the shepherd who seeks the lost sheep from the Pharisees who are indifferent to that lost sheep. Listen once more what Garth shared with us. Which of you, if you have 100 sheep and lost one of them, wouldn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the lost one until he found it? And the Pharisees answer that question, nobody. If you got 100 sheep and you lose one, well, too bad. That's the cost of doing business. In our secular society, we accept certain percentages of failure. In a couple weeks' time, school's going to start. Right? And if I said to you today, and I know I've got some retired teachers here, our brothers and sisters in Christ, if I said to you today, is everybody going to graduate at, from your school, what are you going to tell me? No. Sadly, some people are going to drop out. So we accept there is a dropout rate. All right? If I asked you, do any of you have any idea what the divorce rate is in Canada, it's a staggering and sad 40% of all marriages in Canada fail. If I asked you, do you remember what the unemployment rate in Canada was last year? It was 9.5%. And the infant mortality rate in the world is 2.9%. I remember feeling very confused and frustrated as I was a member of the Cancer Care Ontario Board. Cancer Care Ontario Board, by the way, administers all cancer treatments, research, care, etc. for Ontario. I was the vice chair of that board. And on May 27, 2000, six people died in Walkerton due to contaminated water. And if you remember, the government of the day said, we're holding an inquiry about this contaminated water. We're going to change the laws and reassure people of Ontario this will never, ever happen again. That same year, in the annual report of Cancer Care Ontario, 150 people died of workplace cancer, workplace carcinoma, All right? especially mines, folks, by the way. Any of you that have relatives, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents that worked in the Sindarin plant in Inco, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 55% of all the people that worked in that plant died of lung cancer, all right? And that's not right. Fifteen years later, 2015, that same cancer care annual report said 161 people died of workplace cancer. 150 people, 161 people, it's going the wrong way, isn't it, Wayne? All right, that's not a good number. And yet, it was acceptable because that is the cost in terms of working in toxic environments in Ontario. That's wrong, all right? And you and I both know it's wrong. But when they give you a government report and say, oh, that's okay, then people continue to work in those conditions, which is unacceptable. I'm sure by now you get my point. My point is that we should not allow these situations to exist. As far as the Pharisees are concerned, dropouts, divorces, the unemployed, malignant cancers, and one lost sheep are no big deal. But with God, every sheep counts. With God, we live in community with the flock so that it, to be lost really means separated from the flock. That's a really good sentence I just shared with you. Hope you're paying attention to that one, all right? The, the only reason that the sheep is lost is because it belongs to the flock. If there was no flock, <laughs> the sheep wouldn't be lost, all right? So Jesus and God are telling us, hey, folks, you're the flock. And if somebody gets lost... It's on us. It's in our ministry. It's in our commitment to everybody in our flock that we go and find them. Remember, the good shepherd knows his sheep. He knows when one is missing. So he goes out to look for it. And by the way, something that was always concerning to me is what about the 99, all right? What about those 99, Sarah? All right, were the wolves going to come and get them? No, it was a summer pasture when the parables told about those sheep are safe. Jesus was not neglecting the 99 when he leads them to search for the lost one because he knows that sheep. That sheep is part of his flock. In my bereavement talks, 
I often talk about the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. And that's what I think we need to understand about the flock today between Pharisees and you and I. So we're all here. We go out in the courtyard. They give us some coffee. And somebody decides we're going to have a bit of a campaign to get coats for starving orphans and cold orphans this winter somewhere in an obscure part of the world. So the person goes around with a little clipboard and says, Tracy, do you have any coats that you'd like to give to us? And at Dario, do you have a lot of coats? You go, likely a, ho- a lot of hockey jerseys. Do you have a lot of coats that you can give to us? And, and you're drinking your coffee and thinking, this guy's pretty good about the coats, isn't he? He's getting a bunch of coats. Oh, by the way, where's the cream and the sugar? J- J- Michelle, do you, do you have some more cream and sugar for me? My, I need cream and sugar for my coffee. And yes, I'll give you a coat, all right? You're in that same courtyard. And one of your relatives, who doesn't go to this church, comes running up to you and taps you on the shoulder and says, Dad just had a heart attack. They've rushed him up to the hospital, and, and, and I think you better go up there. Are you going to worry about the rest of the coffee? <laughs> are you going to ask Michelle for some more cream and sugar? Or are you going to put it down and get up to that hospital? But wait a minute. A whole bunch of little kids were going to freeze in somewhere in the world without that coat, and you kept drinking your coffee. All right? So so why did you quit drinking the coffee when you heard about your dad having the heart attack? You know why? Because you love your dad, don't you? All right? And you don't know those kids. You feel sorry for them. All right? That's objectivity. Subjectivity is you love your dad, and and you got to get up to the hospital because you're going to pray about that, and you're going to stand by him, and you're going to hope the Lord gives you some grace of healing, and if not, give you the grace of light in bereavement. And that's what I suggest, that the eyes of all of us, subjectively and objectively, God knows and loves his sheep. This is why it's important for us not to give up on those who have dropped out of church. Is there somebody not here today? You didn't see him last week? Didn't see him the week before? So somebody that you say, hey, they used to always kind of sit with me. Where are they? Are you the shepherd that's going to call this week and say, hey, are you Okay. <laughs> Missed you at church, like you to come back at church. What, what about the people that kind of stray from family relationships? You haven't seen them for a while. Are, are you going to pick up the phone and say, hey, you know what, let's go and have a coffee at Tim Hortons. I'd like to reconnect with you. I, I want to make sure you haven't strayed from our family relationships. It is not simply that they're lost, but we are lost with them because they're part of us. We live in community with each other, or we don't live at all. We all know a Bert. A bird who has strayed, but also we know today that God loves the birds. So what about the birds in your life? Are they simply a statistic that so many people have addictions in Sudbury, so many people have alcohol problems, or or do you put a bird name on that person and say, I got to go find that person. I got to go give that person a hug. I got to tell that sheep that I'm still with them. The most famous painting is the one up there right now from this scripture. It was painted by a guy named Alfred Usher Seward. Great name. He was Norwegian. And and in fact, it was painted in 1898. Now, if you look at that painting, you see that that shepherd's in pretty good shape. But you see this hand? It's it's hanging onto a rock, all right? And and see that staff? It's stuck in the ground. And, And he's leaning over. That is a very dangerous and precarious position. And that shepherd is willing to risk falling off that mountain to in fact help that sheep. And if we had a little bigger screen, you'd see the sheep's head. (laughs) And the sheep's head has got eyes, and those eyes, you can kind of see the sheep's nose. So we're going to pretend the sheep's nose is the sheep's eyes, and it's looking right at the shepherd's eyes. They're locked in. And what does that mean? That that sheep that lamb has to make a decision. Are they going to, is that shepherd going to save me or not? <laughs> am I prepared? He's willing to fall off that mountain and save me. Am I am willing to respond to his care? It's my choice. The lamb chooses to be saved. So this search and rescue mission becomes a search and rejoicing mission. And the verses say, when the shepherd has found the lost sheep, He carries on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his neighbors and friends, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Christ's answer to the chilly indifference 
of the sour cynicism of the Pharisees is the word rejoice. Are you rejoicing? When's the last time you rejoiced? When's the last time you just said, Lord, I am rejoicing. This is a great day. I started every one of my sermons for the last 40 years saying, say good morning louder. And you respond to that. But is it just rhetoric or is it a reality? Do you rejoice? Do you have a happy place, a happy day, a happy relationship? Is there something today that in this church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, is it Sarah's music, is it Sean's prayer, is it my word, that you can leave this place and say, hey, I'm rejoicing at All Nations Church. I'm rejoicing because I am that lamb, that sheep, and I did respond to that shepherd's reach. But it gets even better, doesn't it? The Pharisees condemned sinners, and Jesus welcomed sinners without reprimand or rejection. Don't want to suggest that the sheep and the lamb are people that you and I know, but maybe we do know them, don't we? And rather than sheep and lambs, that is that prodigal son or daughter in our life. That's that person that wasn't always honest with us. That's the person that betrayed some sort of relationship. And when we bring them back, do we have a tendency to end the parable with these words? Well, it's about time. I hope you learned your lesson. You can come back this time, but it better not happen again. <laughs> That's not what Jesus said, did he? Absolutely not. Jesus ends the parable when he tells about the shepherd and all his friends and neighbors and goes on to say, I tell you that even so will be more joy, that word again, joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. This parable is all about hope. This sermon is all about hope. This sermon is asking you and I, here and beyond these walls, that we are his sheep and he is our shepherd. And I asked you last week and I'll ask you this week and I'm going to ask you next week, so you know the shepherd. Do you know the shepherd? Are you saved? Have you met the shepherd? Have you seen his hand reaching out to you? Have you called that hand? And if you tell me that you got saved 30 years ago, I respect that. But my ask is, when did you get your soul renewed? All right. When did you get the little sticker that says, I'm back in the, I'm back in the game. All right. I am rejoicing. I am saved. I'm just renewing that because I want to be alive when I come to All Nations Church. But more importantly, I want to be alive when I leave All Nations Church. That when people bump into me, they're going to say, whoa, look at that person rejoicing. But where did he or she go? They must have gone to All Nations Church. They must have gone to God's house. They must have been able to be full of that light of the shepherd that saved them. Jesus is our shepherd. Let us reach out and grab him as he grabs us. And let us use the words of St. Paul when he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. And we all say, Amen. Thanks, guys. Audio? Sarah's one of my best friends. She and I go back about 20 years. So I want you to come next week because we're going to sing, Oh, Happy Day, all right? And if we don't sing, Oh, Happy Day, they're cutting off your microphone. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs>